Welcome to Lecture 21, Moments of Inertia. In this lecture, we'll be discussing the moments of inertia for areas, the moments of inertia for an area by integration, the parallel axis theorem for an area, the radius of gyration of an area, and the moments of inertia for a composite area. Consider three different possible cross-sectional shapes, A, B, and C, for the beam shown. All of these shapes have the same total cross-sectional area. You can confirm that given the dimensions shown in the figure. And assuming they are made of the same material, they will have the same mass per unit length. So for the given vertical loading P on the beam shown in the figure, which of these shapes will develop the least amount of internal stress and deflection, and why? Well, the answer depends on the moment of inertia, uh, abbreviated MOI, of the cross-sectional area of each particular shape about the x-axis. It turns out that shape A has the highest MOI because its area is distributed further from the x-axis than the areas of B and C. Therefore, A is going to have the least amount of stress and deflection. The moment of inertia for a differential area shown here in the figure about the x-axis is going to be calculated by taking the distance of that differential area from the x-axis, axis, which is y, squaring it and multiplying it by the differential area. In a similar fashion, the moment of inertia about of that differential area about the y-axis is going to be the square of the distance from the y-axis, or x, times the differential area. And if we're working in polar coordinates, then the polar moment of inertia, j sub o, is going to be equal to the distance from o to the differential area which is shown here as r, um, the square of that times the differential area. So we integrate and find that i sub x equals y squared, the integral of y squared dA, i sub y equals the integral of x squared dA, and the polar moment of inertia, j sub o, is equal to the integral of r squared dA. But notice that uh, by the, by the uh, Pythagorean theorem, we can write r squared as x squared plus y squared, distribute those, and do those separate integrations. And those are just ix and iy. So j sub o equals ix plus iy. Now, the moment of inertia is also referred to as the second moment of an area. And notice that its units are length to the fourth power. Fourth power. So if we're working in um, meters, the moment of inertia of an area would have the units meters to the fourth power. If we're working in inches, it would be inches to the fourth power and so on. Calculating the moments of inertia for an area by integration is a very similar process to the one we used for calculating the centroid of an area in the previous lecture. You're going to set up an element dA either horizontally or vertically depending on which um, uh, moment of inertia you're trying to find, whether it's the moment of inertia about the x-axis or the moment of inertia about the y-axis. And it's going to turn out that it's, it's generally 
easier to use a horizontal strip, a horizontal element for determining I sub X and a vertical strip for determining I sub Y. And similar to the uh, the process of integrating um, to find uh, the centroid of an area, if you can express Y easily in terms of X, then you may be able to do both integrations with a vertical strip. So here's how we would integrate to find I sub Y of an area. It's going to be the distance from the Y axis to the differential area squared. And that's going to be this distance X squared. And then we express the differential area in terms of its height and width, which is y dx. And then we need to express y in terms of x or as a function of x. So we're integrating with respect to x. Similar process to calculate i sub x. Here we're using the horizontal strip, the horizontal differential area. The distance from the x-axis to that differential area is y. We square that. Now the differential area has a length of x and a height of dy. And so if we're going to use a horizontal strip, we now need to express x as a function of y and integrate. The parallel axis theorem relates the moment of inertia of an area about an axis passing through its centroid to the moment of inertia of that area about a corresponding parallel axis. We'll be using the parallel axis theorem when we calculate the moments of inertia for composite areas. So let's consider the area shown in the figure here. And the area has a centroid at C. And we can set up a, an X prime axis that's horizontal and thereby parallel to the primary X axis that passes through C. And the distance between the X prime axis and the primary X axis is D sub Y. Now we're just going to focus on the uh, moment of inertia about the x-axis for right now. And we're going to use the parallel axis theorem to determine the moment of inertia of the area shown about the primary x-axis. So we've established that we can write the write this equation for the moment of inertia of an area about the x-axis. And referring to our figure here, carried over from the previous slide with a little bit extra added to it, y is this distance right here between the primary x-axis and the differential element. 
differential area. And notice that y, and I've, I've shown that distance here also, I just wanted to emphasize it. We can write y as the sum of y prime and d sub y. Okay, those two distances, y prime and d sub y, added together give us y. So we can substitute that in for y. And remember, it's still going to be y squared. So when I substitute that in here and expand that, I'm going to have three terms. Let's look at the first term, the integral of y prime squared dA. So what that is, is that's the moment of inertia of the area about the x prime axis, which goes through its centroid, goes through the area centroid. The third term here is just the summation of all the differential areas, which just is going to give us a value for the area in you know square meters, square millimeters, square inches. And d sub y is a constant and could be pulled across the uh, out from uh, inside the integral sign. And we'll usually know d sub y, and, and we'll have to square it for this equation. But let's look at this middle term here. This should look familiar. Remember, that was the numerator in the equation to, uh, we use to find y bar. Uh, the y uh, coordinate of the, the y location of the centroid of an area. Okay. But since the origin of our x prime, y prime coordinate system, remember, referring back to this figure here, we set up that x prime, y prime coordinate system. Since the origin of that coordinate system is located at the centroid C, in other words, x prime, the x prime axis passes through C, then y bar prime or y prime bar, I'm not sure what order to say that in, must equal zero. So if this is equal to zero, then this side of the equation has to be equal to zero and the area isn't going to be zero. It can't be zero. We run into problems there having zero in a denominator. So that means that this term has to be zero. And if that's zero, then this middle term back up here must be zero. And that leaves us with simplifying that three term equation from the top. Ix equals I prime x or Ix prime plus the area times d sub y squared. Now remember, this is the moment of inertia about the x prime axis going through the area centroid. This is just the value of the area, and this is the distance between the primary x axis and the x prime axis. Okay, and we're going to, we can find I sub y 
or uh, this is the parallel axis theorem, and we can write that for I sub Y in a similar fashion here. And if we're working in polar, it's a similar equation there. Now, what this is going to allow us to do is um, we're normally going to be able to calculate a, I know this is getting busy here. We're nor normally going to be able to calculate the area uh, being considered. Uh, we'll know the distance between the, um, uh, the primary x-axis and the x-prime axis. And then the moment of inertia of the area about an axis going through its centroid, we can look that up for simple shapes, just like we looked up the location of the centroid uh, of simple shapes. Okay, and we'll see, we'll be using uh, the parallel axis theorem when we do the moment of inertia for composite areas. The radius of gyration of an area is a quantity associated with the moment of inertia of an area that you'll see used in uh, column design. And what it is, is it's the distance, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, units are length, it's the uh, distance from an axis to a concentrated version of an area where the moment of inertia of the concentrated area with respect to the axis is equivalent to the moment of inertia of the of that given area with respect to the axis and this equation here shows the relation between the radius of gyration which we denote with a little small k and the the moment of inertia. So for some types of problems or or design areas, you'll be you're you're working with the uh, radius of gyration versus the moment of inertia, but you can go back and forth. Obviously, if you know the uh, radius of gyration and the value of the area, you can calculate the moment of inertia. If you know the moment of inertia in the area, you can calculate the radius of gyration using this form of the equation. Calculating the moments of inertia for a composite area is very similar to calculating the centroid of a composite area that we covered in the previous lecture. So you start out either of those types of problems by breaking your composite area, your, your more complex area into simple shapes. In this one, we can have our first shape, first simple shape be the larger rectangle here. Our second shape be the triangle that's on top of the rectangle. And then the third shape, which is going to be a negative area, will be the smaller rectangle uh, shown there. And now just like we did for the centroids, you can look up the moments of inertia of the simpler shapes uh, about the uh, x and y axis in your textbook or online or engineering handbook. And then using that data, along with the parallel axis theorem, um, you would continue uh, and calculate the area of the composite area. Here's a four-step process to determine the moments of inertia of a composite area. First step is to divide that composite area into its simpler shape parts like we discussed on the previous slide. Next, you're going to locate the centroid of each of those simpler parts and indicate the perpendicular distance from each centroid to the desired reference axis. 
Remember that perpendicular distance is that distance d sub y or d sub x as the case requires. Then you're going to use the parallel axis theorem to determine the moment of inertia of each of the simpler shaped parts about the desired reference axis. So here's the parallel axis theorem for the moment of inertia of a part, one of the simpler parts about the primary x-axis, your reference axis. That's going to be the summation of the moment of inertia of that part about the x prime axis. Remember, that's a, that's a horizontal axis parallel to the primary x axis that goes through the centroid of the part. You look that up in your textbook or uh, online, just like you look up the location of the centroid of the part. Here's the perpendicular distance from the centroid um, of the specific part to the x-axis, and that's squared, and then A is just the area of the, uh, of, of the part itself. Okay, so you do this for each of the simpler shape parts. If you have three parts, you're going to do this three times and get a different, a, it, and each part will have its own uh, moment of inertia about the primary x-axis, the, uh, the reference axis. And then you calculate the moment of inertia of the entire area by simply algebraically summing those individual moments of inertia that you obtained in step three. And remember that the moment of inertia of a hole, and remember holes can be circular, quarter circular, uh, triangular, rectangular, square, whatever, that those moments of inertia are considered as negative when you're summing everything up.